Hi everyone, my name is Shoram. I'm part of uh, ICON's uh, executive committee and um, the co-founder of ISC, one of the sponsors of this day. Before I am introducing the keynote speaker, uh, Yasmin asked me to say a few words why I'm involved with ICON. And rule number one is when Yasmin asks for something, just do it. Um, so three reasons I love ICON. Number one, I love Israel, I love America, and ICON shrinks uh, the distance between the two countries and connects the people, make them brighter, better, and more successful. So that's a win-win. The second reason I love ICON is because I love community. I love the notion of community. I believe that communities uh, make our society better and stronger. And if you think about ICON as a transatlantic ecosystem of really bright people that only care about giving back to the community and pay, it for, uh, pay forward. And it's great to be around people that care more about giving than receiving. The third reason that I really love ICON is the secret sauce of the success of uh, this community. And really, it's Yasmin and her leadership that really mobilizes us, uh, energize us, and leading us. Um, and her and her team just did a tremendous and incredible job today. So. They help me thank them. So, um, it's a great privilege to, um, to present to you the keynote speaker today, because she's a real life Wonder Woman. Safra Katz is the co-CEO of Oracle. Um, as many of you know her, um, she's, she was instrumental to make Oracle the empire it is. And she's part of our tribe. She's Israeli-American. She was born in Cholon. She moved here at a young age, as she told me, for one year. And a few years later, she's really at the top of the top um, of the tech industry. Um, and I think that some may say that the only disadvantage and that she was born in Israel that she cannot be a president. But other than that, really, I think that for me, and I'm sure that for many of you, it's inspiring to know that Israeli-American is really at the top of the tech industry in America and for that matter, in the world. So please help me welcome Yasmin and Safrakat. Hi, Safa. Hi, everyone. So first, I have to admit that I'm here because you wanted me to interview you. And yes, I did. Um, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't be admitting it, but I had to Google and find out what Oracle does. So I'm not technical. <laughs> so <laughs> That's okay. Very few people yeah, So I want to talk do. a lot about, about being a CEO, about leadership, okay. about people, and then I'm going to leave it to you guys to ask the technical questions. So, so be ready. <laughs> um, so you were born and raised in Israel, and you were there until you were six. Do you have any memories of your time there? Oh, I have many, many, many memories of Israel. I remember Lag Baomer putting, uh, wrapping, you know, putting potatoes under the coals and under wood and burning them. I remember the phenomenal flowers in the field next to our apartment building in Rehovot. I remember, I remember arriving in kindergarten during Purim and being dressed, of course, as, as of course, who? Queen Esther, you know. And uh, arriving in my kindergarten and being too scared to go in because of the other costumes. That's what I remember. And then, of course, I remember the war, the Six Day War. And I remember my father coming back walking on the street. The street we lived on was very close to the Weizmann Institute. It was Shterot Chen in Rehovot. And the street was unpaved. And he had come all the way from Sinai. And so he was far in the distance walking, obviously, where the bus left him. And he was so far he was so covered with the dust and the sand of the desert 
that I did not recognize him. And my mother said, that's, you know, Abba You know, my, your father has arrived, thank God. And I said, that's not him. That's an old man, you know, because he was just in a beard covered with dust. So what do I remember about Israel? I remember everything. In fact, I remember the very last day we were in Israel after, uh, right before we left for the United States. And I remember waking up what felt like the middle of the night to get on the plane. And uh, it was like we were fleeing. I remember that crazy feeling because I was so scared of America. And uh, so I, I remember a lot. I remember actually I came here for the first time when I was 16 and we were in New York and then there was all the steam coming out of the subway <laughs> and it's like, where, what happened? Where am I? Um, how will you characterize your connection to Israel today? So I, uh, it's a very, very close connection to Israel. My husband, who's in the front row, is a real Israeli. Uh, my children speak Hebrew. My, my father is constantly speaking Hebrew to my husband thinking he's speaking English, realizing only halfway through he's speaking Hebrew. We, um, we were in Israel three times between May and July this year. Um, happy, happy to be at the U.S. Embassy opening in Jerusalem. My dad said it was the happiest day of his life. Okay, my dad went to Hebrew University in Jerusalem to have the U.S. Embassy in our capital. Huge, 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 really important. We also got to celebrate the 4th of July, celebrated on the 3rd of July with the U.S. Ambassador at a giant party where your parents were. And uh, so we have a very, you know, the U.S.-Israel relationship is like stuck in my family, let alone in our community. And it's critical. And I think it's kind of what you brought you here today, so thank you for coming. Of course. Of course. Um, <laughs> so you went to law school. Did yeah. you want to be a lawyer? Was that part of the plan? Yeah. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I was absolutely positive. I had taken a business law class when I was at, uh, at uh, undergraduate business school at a school called Wharton in Philadelphia, part of the University of Pennsylvania. And I thought, this law thing, this is, this is really interesting. And simultaneously, though, in college, I also took what was called decision science, which was business computer science. So you did a lot of programming. And it's in that class that I saw in one of my honors classes this is a long time ago for many of you were like in elementary school. But I saw, because we worked on mainframes and mini computers. And I saw this thing called the Lisa. And it was a personal computer. And it was just such a shocking thing. And I thought, this is going to be amazing. But I still went to law school, and, which I loved absolutely loved. And when I got out, it was the 80s. And for any of you who are old enough to remember the 80s in the United States, it was the wild west of Wall Street. And so that's where I went. But instead of doing what they wanted me to do, which was leverage buyouts, I said, you know, I think this software thing I think that's going to be big. And so they could see I was going to cause them an absolute ton of trouble if they made me stay doing leverage buyouts in the middle of the night. And so they sent me out here to California with one of those telephones that was almost a pocketbook. And, uh, you know, it's like gigantic. And I lived out of my car pretty much. And I started working with all these new companies called P 
PC software companies. There used to be, by the way, a PC software industry. I know now there's just Microsoft, but there was WordStar and WordPerfect in Utah and Lotus in Boston and software publishing. I mean, there were just unbelievable, uh, it was unbelievable. And uh, I worked with all of those guys. And then, uh, um, so yeah, I thought I was gonna be a lawyer. I took the bar just in case. And uh, in case this didn't work out, and uh, I'm always, I've always got a plan B. You see, like for example, Oracle is only my second job that did not involve waitressing, okay? And so I still have my waitressing apron in case this all doesn't pan out. And luckily, I have these things called sweet and low. They're these little pink sugars, fake sugar. And I will bet you that it's still sweet. OK, so yeah, so that's, so that's how it went. So being a lawyer and a banker, I'm sure you're using those skills now as a CEO. Um, other than being a lawyer and a banker, what do you think are the other skills, important skills for a CEO? Well, first of all, let me say that um, though I was given a lot of credit for Oracle's success, it is unfair because the real credit for Oracle's success is in two parts. One is the vision, talent, and expertise of our founder and chief technology officer and chairman and the guy who is at this very moment running a development meeting that I had to leave to join you and for which he will remind me tomorrow, every time I say something, he will say, at the meeting you missed, we did this, okay? So the true talent and the brains of the operation is Larry Ellison, and that is almost always true with founder-led companies. And what is unique in his case is that he's still in charge, and he's still better than everybody else combined. The other piece that gets all this credit is the rest of our 140,000 employees. And there is no question that the talent of these teams around the world is what makes, you know, makes everything possible. It's a team effort, it's a team sport. You have to have a leader. Larry Ellison is it. Don't let titles fool you. Um, I, am, I am very, very helpful as is Mark Hurd, who is my co-CEO. We are uh, good executors, good editors on his vision, but like many of you who are also founders and CEOs and chairmen, you're the guiding lights of your company, and there is no substitute for what you do, none. It is, though, quite helpful to have others on the team who share your vision who are focused on executing your vision, who have no individual alternative agenda. The one thing Larry can count on, in my case, I'm now finishing my 20th year at Oracle, and I'm one of the new kids, and uh, is he, he never has to worry that I've got an agenda any different than to make to make Oracle successful and to make his vision come true. And for those of you who are looking as CEOs, what's good advice for CEOs? Get a team that's really a team that's with you, that's not trying to unseat you, that is absolutely willing to tell you the truth. The relationship I have with Larry, which is very unusual, is my job is to get in an argument with him basically every single day. If he says black, I say white. Not because I believe in white at that moment, but because I wanna make sure he believes in black at that moment. And if I convince him that I was right, I'll bet you know exactly what I do next. I change sides because a lot of the time, especially in technology, you are walking on a path. To me, in my head, the way I see it, 
is we are crossing a field that has never been crossed before and that the grass is this high. So we cannot see if there's a cliff or a hole in front of us. We can't tell what is the right way to get across the field. And we've got to figure it out. There's no path in front of us. I mean, we want to be number one in every market we're in, and there is absolutely no way to be number one by following another number one. You have to be completely differentiated. You can't be 5% better. You have to be 10 times better. And when you're crossing that field, there's no obvious answer how to get across it. So if you're a good CEO, you surround yourself with people who are going to try to figure this out with you, not agree with you. If they agree with you, if that's all they do, what do you need them for? That's what I always tell my, ta my staff. If, if by the time, you know, if all you do hanging out with me is tell me, yep, you're right again, Safra, what another great day. What's the point, right? Their job is to find the flaws in my plan. Where am I going to fall over a cliff? Where am I going to fall into a hole? That's also my job with Larry. And, and that's really, the advice is surround yourself with people. Uh, let me tell you, every single one of my staff, every single one of them are better than me at what they do. They may not be overall, some of them I think are better than me, period, but they, but they don't have the perspective or the experience that I have but they are better than me in their piece of the field. And that is what you want. If you're better than everybody else around you, you don't need anybody else around you. I think that the disagreeing piece comes more naturally to the Israelis. The disagreeing, oh yeah, yes. oh no, no, oh my gosh. No doubt. N nowhere is that more true than when I was an investment banker. Can I tell you a story? Oh my goodness. So here I am taking public dozens of companies, dozens of American software companies. And all of a sudden, there's an Israeli company. I'm doing it with Lehman Brothers. I'm co-manager. I'm not even lead manager. I'm co-manager. It's an Israeli company. It's ba the, the whole team is based out of New York, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The CEO, CFO, COO of this company, they've never done this before. I, of course, have done this 30 times. Meeting number one, they tell me everything we're doing is wrong. In fact, why would you do it simple? when it could be so complicated and confusing. You know, and, and by the end, there was one time that they laid out the structure of their corporate structure, and it had to actually fold out of the perspective four pages. I had never even seen something so ridiculous. And I thought, and they were convinced this was brilliant. The whole structure was to save like five dollars in taxes. I mean, the, 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 it was ridiculous. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawyers, but we saved five dollars on taxes. And uh, so I remember thinking to myself, I remember complaining to my husband, and all he, and he would say is, Israelis. What do you expect? And uh, I learned my lesson. Um, you mentioned Mark, and I wanted to talk a little bit about being co-CEOs. Um, when, we, when we see a startup that's coming to us and they choose to have co-CEOs, we tell them it's a mistake. We say you have to have distinct roles and understand the responsibility, and it's more challenging when you come as co-CEOs. Um, how did that happen, and how does that work for you? So in our case, we're not a startup. Okay, we're not a startup. At, a, at 140,000 employees in basically every country, 40 billion in revenue, billion with a B, um, which is a lot, 
which is really, I mean, maybe, I, maybe in this room it's not a lot to you guys, but like to me it seems it's a lot, especially in dollars. And uh, so um, the truth is when you are as big as we are, I'm not even sure how you can be just one executive in charge. Honestly, it is, it is a two-man job, two-woman job, three-person job. It is so much work. Every single week, I come home on Friday, I say to my husband the exact same thing. I said, that was the hardest week ever. And he said, you said that last week. And, you, you know, and the same exact thing. So I can understand how with a startup, you want to have one person, and that's the plan, and there's no conflict between. You don't want politics. So I actually support your advice 100%. At Oracle, we've split up the work such that Mark is completely focused on sales, support, marketing, that consulting, that end of it. I am day-to-day -day operations. Larry is development, which w in which I participate. And, but ultimately, the real vision and direction is set by Larry Ellison. And there's no confusion. And Mark and I are very, very clear that Larry is the setter of direction. And neither Mark or I, you know, would ever consider unseating or even, even think about it, because it's, it's a team sport for us. We work together, we discuss everything, even when it's outside of our specific sp sphere. But it's because it's a really big place. It's really big. We got a lot going on. And uh, for a startup, I'm glad One you support, boss I'm is, glad you is support better. my advice. Totally. So I'm warming up. We're going to get to Oracle soon, but let me ask you a question about a really a personal favorite. Um, you recently joined Disney's board. Yes. And I was there this weekend. So what I really want to know is, do you have to stand in line no. when you go there? No. This is why I joined. You, kidding, you're on to me. No, that's, not, that's not my question. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> I'm sure Disney's an exciting company, but even I knew that it's very different than Oracle. And uh, I'm sure you're getting a lot of requests to join, to join boards. Um, how did you make, why did you say yes to this one? Well, so the first public board I joined, and I was on it for eight years, I retired a couple years ago, was a bank called the HSBC. And they're a customer of Oracle's. I joined them because I thought they needed technical help, frankly, at the time. And I also thought it would be incredibly interesting. I came from banking. Um, HSBC got through the banking crisis, which, by the way, I joined during the crisis. So I knew I was in the splash zone, as it is. And um, it was really brilliant. It was, I really, really liked it. It was very interesting. Um, Banking was hard. Um, the banking, the, the board package at the beginning when I first joined was 600 pages long. Luckily, I had a 12-hour flight to London or to Hong Kong, as the case may have been. So, uh, um, you know, I had plenty of time to read, uh, but it was very interesting. When I did, I'm only allowed one public board at a time, so when I was going to get a chance to do another one, I had a lot of choices, and I'd like a show of hands at the end uh, as to which you would pick. So um, I had uh, insurance, more banking, hospitals and healthcare, drug companies, or Disney. Okay. <laughs> Can I see the hands of the folks who would not have picked Disney? Okay, there we go. The only one that I thought was kind of interesting I didn't list was weapons systems, okay? I thought uh, that was actually kind of interesting because it was two weapon systems. The company made two of the big weapon systems that Israel uses so uh, to defend itself, and that was uh, pretty darn tempting, but Mickey Mouse won out, so. Thank you. So and I don't I, have to wait in line, not not at all. I mean, I get to go in the back door, evidently. 
Do they need another person? For the board? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, I warmed up. I can ask like a self oracle question. Um, you've been there close to two decades, and I'm sure you've seen the company's culture evolve throughout the years. Um, how is Oracle's culture, how was it throughout the years? How did it evolve, and what are your plans going forward for culture? So, this is kind of it. It's kind of interesting to see it with a little bit of perspective. First of all, the culture is entirely led by development. It is a geek's paradise, okay? It is everything begins and ends with technical capability. We are not a flashy operation. The types of things we think about are extremely complicated and sort of not very sexy unless you love this stuff. For example, let, let me give you an example of what we break our heads on. So Oracle was originally founded, and why it has that kind of creepy name, really, um, all-knowing Oracle, um, it was in fact founded as a CIA project, okay? And the CIA named it Oracle, um, just so that you know, the project actually failed. But the relational database that was built ended up being fantastic. And um, the focus of it was extremely high performance computing for relational databases at the time. Now, we're in the process of, of, of really ramping our cloud. Now, at Oracle, we don't really, we don't make any games, we don't have any toys. Most people have no idea what we do. And in fact, when customers come visit us, sometimes they go to Microsoft first, and then they come to us. And you know, they've always got like an Xbox in their backpack. And you know, I warn them that at Oracle, the best you're gonna do is like maybe get a notebook or a pen, and maybe a hat that says Oracle, because we have no toys. It, what? Sailboat, you can come see the sailboat. It, it, that's the big sailboat, yeah. And uh, the, the thing is that, for example, as we move to the cloud, the generation that we're work that we've got that we've launched completely isolates the processor that is running the clouds the 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 customer's workload and a completely different security processor completely different for which none of the memory is shared and it runs and it runs the network and the, the system, the two's data, which I know I'm boring you guys to death, you're probably sleeping, but this is what, you see, you can tell though, I'm excited about this, okay? That's us, that's our culture. We can sit for hours talking about that. That culture, very, very important. All very technically driven, all around. Now. As the millennials have rolled into Oracle over time, we've had to get a little bit more um, user-friendly, let's say. And, um, and we're making an effort. See, we never used to, for example, we'd never have an employee summit. It was just not a thing we did. I mean, we're working, we're solving, we're up in the middle of the night, you know, we're just not thinking like that. But now, we're trying to be a little bit more hip by having employee summits and surveys and 360 degree um, views of each other and all of that. I never fill out the survey, so just FYI. I'm a, a conscientious objector. Um, but the, the younger folks and all that were trying to be a little bit, a little bit cooler. Um, but really, the bottom line with us is we believe that if our products are way better, not a little better, way better, our customers, our customers will use them. And, you know, we've got Oracle Open World in a week and a half, and it's going to be a giant geek fest. You know, t tens of thousands of our customers are going to roll around and talk to each other about what they love about us. I mean, it's the greatest time of our year. And it is where you get to see our culture because ultimately, 
our whole product line is in the back. You never know about us. And, the only, and so it is based on making our, of allowing our customers to be successful. And ultimately, it's about shining in reflected glory. No one's ever heard of us. I can't tell you how many people, you know, outside of Silicon Valley, I say I'm from Oracle. They say, ah, the Warriors? You know, you own the Warriors? Okay, we don't own the Warriors, but we have excellent seats, okay? And, uh, um, but, it, but most people don't know what we are. So I just say, it's a software company. It's like Microsoft, you know? What else am I going to say? They don't realize that your iPhone is a paperweight without our technology, that basically we'd all be sitting in a dark cave uh, without our technology because pretty much your bank wouldn't work, your GPS wouldn't work, you couldn't make a phone call, the heating in your building won't work, the traffic lights won't work, the satellite system would go down. So that's they what say, we they do. They say the same about Israeli technology. If you take, if you want to do BDS, yeah. you know, take out everything. Stop using your phone. Stop using that's your computers. That's right. Um, True. So, so you're happy with what the culture stands? You don't, you know, you just adjust to the millennials, and no yeah. major changes going forward. Well, you know, just keep evolving, keep changing, keep trying to get a little friendlier. Still geeky. So I'm ready for a heavier question. Um, sure. What are the top challenges Oracle is facing now? Well, just moving to the, to the cloud. I mean, we've been 40 years the most successful database. I mean, when Satya Nadella was asked, I think it was such a nice compliment of him too. He was asked, of all the intellectual property you could have, what would you want? He said the Oracle database. So imagine that, the world's most important data, including the Israeli government, of course the United States government, all of our friendly allies around the world, virtually every important company in the world, the underlying world's most important data, most valuable data, is in Oracle. And it's been on premise. And the move to the cloud you cannot move those databases to any cloud. And the Gen 2 cloud that we've built, which I was just mentioning a minute ago, you know, that was a darn lot of work. And Gen 1 is not good enough, and Gen 2 is right. And so this is the challenge. It's a technical challenge, is getting out there because bringing that Oracle database to the cloud it's taken us a decade. You know, for some of you guys, you haven't been around a decade. It's a full decade. We spend $5 billion a year on R&D, which even to me is a lot of money, and maybe to some of you. So that's been our challenge, and we are there, and we're very excited about it. But let me tell you, it was hard. It was hard. Thousands of engineers making sure that that cloud is not 5% better, but 10 times better. A lot of work. I'm sure they're going to ask more questions about that, so I'll move on and leave you <laughs> some questions for later. Um, I read online that you're credited with spearheading uh, Oracle's ac uh, aggressive acquisition strategy. Um, we have a lot of entrepreneurs here that would like to be acquired one day um, by a big corporation. Um, you know, if we can talk a little bit about M&As, um, kind of, you know, how do you decide when do you want to build, buy, or partner? Uh, how do you integrate well after you do uh, what? And you know, what advice do you have to startups that they should do early on to be more attractive um, and be bought later on by a corporation like Oracle? A lot. There was a lot of questions in there. All right, M &A, let's M &A. Start. All right, M&A, yes. So M&A for us is always a buy or build decision. It's a time to market decision. I've got engineers. We can build a lot of things, but we can't build everything. In addition, we don't have a monopoly on all the good ideas. Israeli uh, startups, in fact, are some of the most creative in the world. Solving problems, really an Israeli thing, doing the impossible, I think a very Israeli thing. And um, so when we're looking at startups, 
And it's usually more than a startup, to be honest, when we're buying it. Every once in a while, it's a small operation. But generally, we want to buy someone when, they, when they're already being successful. Um, we, I can tell you the things that immediately are a problem for us. If they've built their tech stack, technology stack, dependent on a technology other than ours, or something that we think is dead ending, or extremely dependent on somebody else, this is usually a bad situation. It's not a, it's not a complete killer, but it's every red flag starts popping up. Because what it means is we're gonna have to rewrite the entire thing. We are not, we don't like to be dependent on anyone else. The reason we bought Sun Microsystems is we wanted to own Java. Java was simply too important, even though it's in a community and all that. The fact that all of our 100 plus SAS modules were built in Java meant we could not, in our view, allow it to be owned by another company. We needed it to be invested in. We could not have it hit a wall. So for us, when we're looking at uh, a startup, if they've taken too many shortcuts. Technology-wise? Yeah, too many technical shortcuts, or they've, they've sort of scoped themselves to be small, which means I'm going to have to rewrite it all, <sighs> might not be worth it. The other thing we look at, by the way, is the team. Many times the team is very, very important. If I see an executive who's in charge and the, the entire team is going to disappear, you know, very quickly, it's like buying something that's a mirage because the people make a difference. If they don't have a really a cohesive team, and a leadership that's committed to staying on and being successful. Just so that you know, many of the folks who run major groups at Oracle were acquired, came in through acquisitions. We make it worth their while, and often we can put so much more resource behind their idea, but they've got to be really committed to hang with us. So if they're not willing to do that, if they're sort of, hey, I've done 15 of these, and I sell it off, and then I sell it off, these end up being disasters. We, we, we already learned our lessons. I, I, we bought some of these uh, um, mirages before. We, we need the team to stay, um, or at least a big part of it. Um, and then finally, on integration. Integration is where the cultures uh, run into each other. And the bottom line is that we're a really large operation, but it's different. It's even more than that. The standard to which we are held is completely different than the standard to which a startup is held. When we bought, or even a smaller company, we bought a company that made something called WebLogic, which was a Java server, web server, a long time ago. When it's Oracle, the security requirements are so high that, in fact, WebLogic, which was a public company at the time, we bought it, BEA Systems. We took the product off the market until we could secure it, okay? Now, that's a public company software we got. Now, imagine the startups, the type of security scan, the review, the, ethica, the ethical hacking, the, the, the things, the, the code scan, you name it, that we put it through. It's got to be ready to be hit with an all-out assault. Our customers, when they see its Oracle, they understand that it is often Orange Book certified, which is security standard, and it's got to be able to handle massive amounts of volume. And, you know, and, and that's a different standard because that's what's expected. I mean, I can't tell the Air Force, oh, yeah, forget about, I know you bought 
a whole bunch of Oracle and you bought this little thing I sold you with it. And I know it went down the moment, you know, uh, 500,000 transactions went through it, but I just bought it, so I'm sorry. I mean, that's just not a good answer to the United States Air Force. That's just not a good answer. It's got to be able to survive an attack. And, and so, if it, it, so when a product has been built with a lot of shortcuts, technical shortcuts, it's not as appealing. Can I ask you one more question about M&As, um, about pricing. Uh, how do you decide how much you're willing to pay? Many times you buy a startup that just started to have revenues. You're not sure about the potential. I read that you paid uh, Oracle paid $10 billion for PeopleSoft way back in 2005. Uh, you read about other stories around. Um, it's obviously not related to the revenues. So what should founders know about pricing? Okay. As a seller, you want more. As a buyer... I want to pay less. I knew that. Okay? That's it. I teach a class. I teach at Stanford Business School, an M&A class. And I have a bunch of my friends come and teach uh, an hour uh, every week, uh, you know, out of my three hours. And uh, I have Frank Quatron, who um, is the founder of Catalyst, actually. He'll be teaching in a couple weeks. And... Uh, the reality is that what makes a difference between what price is going to be paid and what isn't is really is, is extremely situational specific. Because if there are other folks who have a very similar product and you're just a smidgy better, you're not going to get that much money. If you are the only one and you can cut a lot of time to market for the buyer, you could get a lot more money and if there are other buyers competing. And so it's no different than if you're trying to buy a house in Palo Alto, okay? It's all about the situation at, at that moment because all rules go out the window. I mean, I can tell you we're doing valuation this Friday in, uh, at Stanford in my class. And, you know, we d we've done over 100 deals, and PeopleSoft was $8.8 billion. NetSuite was even more than that. And we graph them, and you would think like, oh, you know, Oracle, we would never pay more than X. But every once in a while... We may pay, you know, a hundred times revenue because revenue is really small. And other times, we won't pay more than two times revenue. And so there are no rules. The rule is, you know, you get a sense of what other stuff is trading, but ultimately, it's how unique is this to the buyer and is there another buyer? I always like there to be no other buyer but us. And then the price just goes down and down and down and down. Because let me tell you one thing. If there's no other buyers and you tell us there's another buyer, trust me, we'll know. We won't get even, but we won't forget. I'm supposed to leave time for question. I want to leave about 20 minutes for questions, but I got like so many more questions that I want to ask. So I'm going to ask one more, and then you guys, you have to have good questions, because if I don't like your questions, I'm just going to go back to mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> you mentioned Stanford Business School. Uh, so I have to ask, I went to Stanford Business School, so and some of my classmates, or you know, I learned from other classes are here as well. Um, I remember my admissions essay. There's one question on the admissions essay for Stanford Business School. And it is, what matters to you most and why? And I want to ask you, what matters to you most and why? Oh, with me, there's not even a question. There's nothing that matters more to me than my family. I mean, beginning or an end. You know, for me, for me, if my kids are okay, my husband's okay, my dad's okay, my sister, that's all I care about. I, I mean, people always say, oh, you must have such a stressful job. It must be so stressful making quarter after quarter. Or the Not stressful. Not stressful. Okay, watching my son play soccer, stressful. 
Okay, extremely stressful. That is all that has ever mattered to me. You know, is the family, you know, now me personally, what matters to me? Like in my work, I can tell you, for me, making decisions is not very hard. It's not very hard. There are sometimes people say, oh, there's such a tough decision. I don't know. Oftentimes, I, I just think that the difference between right and wrong is very obvious. I really do. And um, sometimes in business, I'm amazed by some of the decisions my colleagues in the industry have made when they've been, I think they've kind of gotten off track. And they've uh, maybe exchanged short term for long term. They've exchanged um, really their principles for the right answer. And uh, I find it not at all stressful because I, I, I have a lot of clarity on that, and you know, that is um, it's probably taught by my parents, God bless them, uh, for, uh, you know, f you just stay straight, you just do the right thing, you do as well as you can, um, everything else kind of takes care of itself. So this makes me feel like I cheated in my essay because I wrote that what matters to you most is to be happy, and being happy encompasses your family, your career, your community, <laughs> well, everything. You're smarter than me. That's a little yeah. I'm always it. happy. So if my kids are fine and my husband, yeah, but it feels like I cheated. Okay, so I'm gonna let you ask a few questions, but I'm warning you again, they better be good. Uh, the I mic. Better. So I'm gonna start. <laughs> sure. Um, Safra, thank you so much. Um, my name is Donna. Um, we just yesterday had a, a gathering of women, Israeli women in innovation here in Silicon Valley, in New York, in Tel Aviv, in Berlin, in Toronto, uh, as a response to Angela Merkel's visit last week, uh, surrounded by men. Uh, I'm sure that's not a situation that's unfamiliar to you. Um, I'd love to hear your take now on the changing of the balance of trying to get more women into STEM, more women into management positions, what do you think is holding back and what would your advice be to female founders, to female executives moving up the ranks? Is that good enough, Yasmin? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it's a, a wonderful it's a question. Good. It's a really great question, actually. It's so packed. So I have to tell you, I remember the first time I looked around one of my advanced mathematics classes at the University of Pennsylvania. And we must have already met like four times. And only then did I realize I was the only girl in the class, okay? I mean, I, I saw my classmates, they were like, I mean, this was very advanced mathematics. There might have been nine of us in the whole class. And I realized I was the only girl. And, you know, because to me, everyone I looked around looked exactly the same. And I didn't understand that I didn't look like them. And I just, um, and I've always focused on just doing my job. You know, whatever is the mission, I'm always extremely focused on the mission. And that has made me a bit blind to some of these issues because I was always one of the only girls, almost always. And, um, and it's interesting, when I started in investment banking, the bank I worked for tried so hard, and in fact, our starting class was half women and half men. I was the only woman to make managing director. A number of my colleagues, men, they made managing director either a year after me or even with me. But not a single one of the women I started with in investment banking made it to the same level I did. And in fact, we're even with the firm when, when I was made investment bank. It, now, the question is why? What, what's going on? And I have to tell you that I got extremely lucky, but I also noticed something. What I noticed early on is that the 
guys in my class were often given the better assignments, just naturally, because they were, they'd go play golf with some of the partners, and I didn't do that. In fact, I had a policy, I didn't socialize with my colleagues at all. I, I basically avoided the Me Too movement problem by deciding that I wasn't, that you know, three associates at a bar is not a business meeting. And, uh, and as a result, I just always was very focused on my job. Now, I think it's a good thing that we're now highlighting to the men in power often that they really should, because I think a lot of the bias is actually unconscious even for them. They are not, they were not trying to discriminate. I, I really don't think so. It just never even occurred to them to give me one of the big projects. And um, so what did I do? I had a fantastic mentor, male mentor, who started the technology group. My husband and I just visited him and his wife in, in New Jersey a few months ago. And uh, he was starting a technology group, and I said, I want to do software. This is the 80s. It's going to be big. And he said, fine. I'll let you go do that. I'll cover for you as you build this business. And had I not done that, it is absolutely for sure because I would have I would have sort of either gotten exhausted, you know, gotten the worst projects or whatever. But instead, I saw something different, and I said, "I'm going to go do that." And I was lucky enough that he understood that I could make him very successful, and 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 worked my way through it, and and ended up doing many of the software transactions for. Uh, decade and a half in which I worked in banking. The, I think that highlighting the issue is very, very helpful. My management team is absolutely full of women leaders. In fact, until she retired, my head of manufacturing was a woman, which is unbelievably unusual. Um, I got her from Sun Microsystems. I, I was so sad when she finally retired, and um, and I think you have to lead by example. And one of the things we do at Oracle, and the reason that we built the first public high school on a corporate campus, D Tech High School, is because it, we built Oracle did we built special programs for girls because a lot of these young girls in the beginning of high school. They really don't know how to do programming. They don't know how to do really anything on, on, in that field, and they're very insecure about it. We created some programs that brought together fashion and technology called wearables, and these girls got so confident that they then took much more senior and advanced classes. And so I think it's important. How do you solve this? You saw, you know, you're, you're boiling the ocean one spoonful at a time, but you know what? It's still worth boiling. And, uh, you know, we do it in high school. We also focus on um, uh, community colleges, universities, training programs, and, and of course, you know, we, we work, go out of our way to hire um, not only women, but minorities. And um, I, I will tell you that the program I started almost 20 years ago with the United uh, Negro, with the United Negro College Fund focused on historically black colleges. Again, I don't know if it, you know, racism or wh what causes, but there are not enough minorities in, in technology. You got to reach in and, and do more. And so that's what I've been doing. Thank you. Hello, how are Hi. you? Nice Great. to see you. Thank you. Marvelous comment so far. Thank you to Yasmin as well for organizing everything, as usual. Um, we live in a time with a lot of geopolitical tension and difficulties. And there's IP issues about theft in certain parts of the world, and there's issues about trade sanctions that come along. And you've been through this a lot, 
as a big company, but a lot of the folks that are starting, sitting in this room are just starting out on that journey. What we're seeing in our venture capital portfolio is that more and more companies are sort of born international. They're having to navigate with a war for talent that's global, and they have customers and the suppliers and partners all over the world. So what is your sort of learning and lessons that for applicable for startups or, or mid-sized companies um, in these winds that are blowing us around um, in the geopolitical sphere for a startup in tech? So for smaller companies, those winds should not be blowing too hard, honestly. I mean, it, it, for a good startup, they're going for a big market. But when they're small, they should focus on the markets that they have the most advantage in. And, th and trying to be everything when you're small ends up being very dilutive, I think. I mean, there are certain countries where you have to have a very clear-eyed evaluation about whether they're worth doing. Um, probably at the top of the list would be China. Um, for software companies, at least for us, China's never been a very big market because of um, intellectual property um, uh, use that is not always paid for, and, uh, and also for national security reasons. And so it's never been a big country for us in comparison to others. Um, the way Oracle grew up was it started in the United States, went to the UK, Australia, you know, some of the easier countries, the rest of mainland Europe, and work their way through it. I think for startups, try, one of the big mistakes, and listen, I'm not an expert, but I've just seen it a number of times in some of our acquisitions, the reason they've gotten themselves overextended is because they tried to do too many things too quickly. And instead of getting really good, um, they, just, they just spread themselves too thin, and they got caught up. And the world has gotten a lot more complicated recently, and I would focus, I would, I would not try to solve every problem as a startup or as a young company. I would try to do, you know, do the easy stuff first. Do the low-hanging fruit first. Grab that. Get all the references you can. Get some of the really good name brand references that can be used globally. You know, if your customer is J.P. Morgan Chase, you can, everybody knows who J.P. Morgan Chase is. If your customer, you know, is some company in, you know, somewhere else, not that good. So don't be everything. Just be really good at what you do. That's probably a good, good advice. Uh, Oracle is sitting on one of the most valuable things that your customers have, usually the data. You organize it, you really make it uh, available, non-available, you police it, uh, you manage it. So how do you see it work in the future? How do you see that we will consume it differently tomorrow? Well, up to five years, almost, right? And it's very interesting because every five or six years, there's this belief like, oh, there's a new thing. It's dead. Oracle's dead. Database is dead. You know, relational is dead. SQL's dead. All these things. So is dead. You know, uh, what's that? There's an old saying, I think Mark Twain said, news of my demise are greatly exaggerated. Okay. So the reality is that we are truly at the dawn of the information age. Because that's what data is really useful for, right? Giving you information to make decisions. Now, this period is particularly data-driven, OK? Because with IoT, with huge, huge amounts of data coming from all systems, OK? Probably half the watches in this room, you know, it's just sending data into an into iCloud, which is ours. And, uh, you know, I got all your heartbeats. Uh, um, but nonetheless, just kidding, just kidding. Um, so uh, this is the most exciting time because all of that data is enabling a new period, which is, you know, we've been talking about AI, artificial intelligence, 
for decades, okay? And for, you know, you, many of you are quite technical and, and you know that 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, when people said AI, they were talking about people writing rules. If this happens, do this. If that happens, do this. AI, that kind of rules-based AI was a failure. What is today's AI and why is it actually here? Two reasons. Huge amounts of data, very good for Oracle, huge amounts of data and very inexpensive computing that allows systems to see patterns that would be undetectable by people. It's just too massive or also in which the system can actually learn from these huge amounts of data. So for folks like us that are the repository, the tools, and the analytics and the machine learning technology underlying artificial intelligence, autonomousness, same, AI. It's all, all additional words. What are they? They're all about giant pieces of data. Giant amounts from which decisions are made, sometimes by humans, sometimes by systems. So how do we feel about our prospects? It's the dawn of the information age. This is the most exciting time. When you ask yourself, why does Larry Ellison, what is he, the eighth richest man in the world? I've lost track. It's been a bad day in the market. So, but I think he's still eighth. Okay, he owns almost a third of Oracle. Okay. Why does that guy, why is that guy, what time, six o'clock? This development meeting that I walked out of is still running right this minute. And you wonder, why does that guy go to work? Why is that guy going to work? He's got his own Hawaiian island, okay? He has an island in paradise. He's down the road here at Oracle headquarters running a giant development meetings. Why? Because that's how sure we are that this is the most exciting time in technical history for us. And you know why he's there? Because he loves winning, loves winning. Loves winning, and this is winning. This is the moment, this is 40 years of work are coming to fruition right now. I think this is an excellent theme to end. We could spend hours, I could spend hours talking, but we ran out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Y it's yes, incredible. Me. Thank you. Can I take one moment to thank you all? Thank you all, it's been a privilege. It, it, it's really a privilege to be in front of you, my countrymen, my friends. I have a number of friends in the audience, my husband. And Yasmin, I wanna take a moment to thank you for inviting me. You've been an unbelievable hostess. Your staff's been wonderful, but you in particular are a wonderful friend. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be in front of you all. Thank you. Thank you.